Thank you. Can we give Jesus a hand clap of praise this morning? Amen. You guys can be seated. been talking to Pastor Chuck a little bit this week and they've had an incredible time over there in, in London, England. Um, I don't know how you can stand the food. The English food is disgusting to me. Um, so, I mean, even even you go to McDonald's and they don't even give you ice in your drink, you know? I don't know. But it, they had an incredible time. They're wrapped up this morning. They're about six hours ahead. And he's probably even watching uh, right now. I don't know. Um, so... Let, let's give him a hand clap of praise if he's if he's watching. You know, I like to start off a little lighthearted every time. So there was a guy who went to the top of Mount Sinai to get closer to God and to talk with him. And the guy asked him, how long is a million years to you? And God replied, it's about a minute. And then so the guy replied back, so a million dollars is like a penny to you. And God said, yep. So the guy asked him, well, can I have a million dollars? And God replied, yeah, in about a minute. <laughs> I know they're just corny, but I'm trying to relate to different groups. You know, the young people, they didn't, you know. You know, your firstborn, if your firstborn eats dirt, you're going to rush him to the hospital. I know we did. We were so careful with everything with our firstborn. You know, your secondborn, he eats dirt. You're probably just going to wash his mouth out. Your thirdborn, if he eats dirt, you're probably going to wonder if they need to have lunch too. You know, our, our, our secondborn, Roman, he eats toilet paper. We got we to gotta close the bathroom door because he'll go in there and start picking toilet paper and eating it. And I'm like, well... As long as it's not used, uh, I'm okay with that. I, did I go too far? Was that too much? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Pastor Chuck's been preaching really hard on climate changers, and I'm just going to continue on uh, in that series. Uh, I think it'll be the final one. Uh, I know he did like seven messages in climate change, something like that. I know Pastor Mark did one, and I'll wrap it up here. Um, with the last one. Um, I'll be in Mark chapter 9 mostly. Or I'm sorry, in the book of Mark mostly. Mark, Mark chapter 9 verse 2. It says this, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them on a high mountain apart by themselves. And it says that he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them and Moses, and they were talking to Jesus, talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and the other one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. One scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse one and two, I beseech you therefore brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And we'll stop there. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us an opportunity to gather this morning to, to hear, not hear me, to, but to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us this morning. And I just, right now, I just, uh, as 
each and every one of us are climate changers. Father God, we just create a climate where the word can be received in our hearts. It can uh, cause us to think differently, to uh, have thoughts that are your thoughts, have the mind of Christ. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you that we're not going to get in the way of the Holy Spirit this morning. We're going to step aside and let him do what he wants to do for each and every single one of us this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, what? Well, we have really worked hard here at New Harvest Church, really for the last 28 years, is really to try to build a culture on what is God doing right now, what he's doing right now. You know, we had uh, the times in the past uh, from Azusa Street on to the, uh, the revivals in the 60s, the 90s, uh, the different revivals uh, throughout North America and even Europe. But we've always been uh, trying to create a, build a culture on what God is doing right now. And, um, and trying to arrange our thinking, our conversation, our planning, and our praying around that. Um, how many of you know that it's abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the impossible? That's abnormal. It's not the normal Christian life. The normal Christian life says that I must have, that in me there is an appetite for the impossible. It's been written into our spiritual DNA to hunger for the impossibilities around us so that they can bow to the name of Jesus. And I just say this right now, while we were in worship, I believe that hunger is going to set the standard on what the Christian life is going to be like or should be like here in North America. Hunger will be the standard. By your hunger level, you're going to set the standard on, on what it is Jesus is going to be doing here, in our, even in our community here. And I just want to say that the lack of miracles that we probably see in North America um, you know, because we do, we, this is a country where we have everything. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if we need money, we'll go to the bank and get a loan. Or uh, a lot of us have great savings accounts. Our houses are paid off. We have cars. We have everything to our disposal. But the lack of miracles isn't because it's not God's will for us. I mean, you know, that it is God's will for us to experience miracles. In 1 Corinthians 12, the gifts of the Spirit, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the working of miracles. But the problem, the problem, listen to me now, the problem exists between our ears. It exists between our ears. As a result, a transformation, a renewing of the mind is needed. A renewing of the mind is needed. Probably one of the the, the phrases probably that I mention probably every time that I speak is that phrase, a renewed mind or, or a different way to think or a, uh, think from a higher perspective. Because it's one of the things that as Christians that either that it's going to hinder us or it's going to help us. Because how many of you know that faith is not going to come from uh, my thought life? Faith is going to come from the heart. But it is my thought life that's going to either going to help or hinder that. So a renewing of the mind is needed. And it's only possible through a work of the Holy Spirit that is typical upon desperate people. I mean, when was the last time that we were actually so desperate for something? Do you know a lot of us will, will, will start our businesses or will come fresh out of college with, with this hunger and this desperation to change the world or do something? Um, but, at, you know, we get so complacent in our walk that that desperation or that hunger level begins to fall or drop. Stories of the impossible are becoming the norm. And the company of people who have joined this quest uh, for the authentic gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel that is increasing, throughout the world. Don't ever think that just because churches are closing down here in America that the gospel of the kingdom is not going forward. 
Because there's, there's people that, that, that have such an appetite and a hunger level in other countries that you cannot deny, deny the, uh, the, uh, the, the presence of God moving in those countries, moving amongst those people. So loving God and his people is an honor. Would you agree with that? Loving God and his people should be an honor. We will no longer make up excuses for powerlessness uh, because powerlessness is inexcusable by itself. Uh, our mandate is simple, is to raise up a generation that can openly display the raw power of God. And we, we see that his primary purpose, when Jesus came to this earth, his primary purpose is, is written there in Matthew 4, 17. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his primary message. That was, you look at the, the life of Jesus, those 33 and a half years, and that is his primary message uh, uh, that he preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, there's something that, caught them completely off guard during his uh, life whenever he said that. Um, uh, he, that he brought his world to him. He literally brought his entire world, his being. How many know that Jesus did every single miracle as a man? You know, I'd be pretty impressed if, if he did it all as, as the fullness of God uh, or, or the God. But how many know that he was, did every single thing as a man? He slept. He got hungry, he drank, uh, he did everything as a man. But repentance means way much more than weeping over sin or even turning from those sins to follow God. It's not a prayer you pray when you first come to the altar. That is part of it, but that's not what repentance is. Let me just show you something in Hebrews 12, 17, and it's the story the, the writer of Hebrews is mentioning Esau, brother, uh, the brother of Jacob. And it says here, For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought, sought it diligently with tears. It sounds like Esau was crying his heart out at the altar, looking or seeking repentance, but he found no place for repentance because repentance is not a prayer. Repentance means that you change the way of your thinking. Repentance is you change your mind. You change your mind. And it's, and it's only in changing the way that we think that we can discover the focus of Jesus' ministry, which is the kingdom. To change your mind and to set on a new course. I'm going to change the way that I've been thinking, and I'm going to turn and go a new direction. This is not just a heavenly mandate to have happy thoughts. Obeying this command is possible only for those who surrender to the grace of God. The renewed mind is the result of a surrendered heart. The renewed mind is the result of a surrendered heart. So in our text, we... We, uh, we read that, that to be any use to the kingdom, our minds must be transformed. Uh, because in our text, we, we see that Peter, James, and John go up to the mountain with Jesus. This was right after, um, uh, in Mark chapter 9, when they fed the 5,000, then they fed the 4,000, and, um, and then he... Uh, there, they went off to the lake, and that's when Jesus was walking on the water and scared them. And he said, do you not care that we perish? This was right after all this. And so they go up to the mountain, all three of them. And all of a sudden, they see Elijah. They see uh, Moses there. And Peter, uh, the one who always speaks up, he started saying, well, I mean, should we even be here? Do we need to build three altars, one for each of you guys? But... One of the things that is so powerful in that scripture is that we find a clue what that word means in transfiguration of Jesus, what that word actually means. Uh, when he talked to, to, with Moses and Elijah, 
because the reality of heaven radiated uh, through Jesus because it says that his robe, his clothes were as white as you can get and his face was, uh, was shining like the sun. And um, his body revealed a reality of another world. He was transfigured. He was not a normal, did not look like a normal man or, 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 or a normal person in that time. He was different because the word transformed in that passage is the same word we find in Romans chapter 12 too when it talks about a renewed mind. It's the same word. It's the same word in, in Romans 12 too where Paul talks about do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is the same word that that uh, is talked about in Jesus in Mark chapter 9 as far as the transfiguration goes because the renewed mind then reflects the reality of another world in the same way Jesus shone with heaven's brilliance the renewed mind reflects that it reflects Jesus in the natural as how he was on the Mount of Transfiguration because it's not just that our thoughts are different, but that our way of thinking is transformed because we think from a different reality, from heaven toward earth. That becomes our new thought pattern. That becomes our new perspective. That is a transformed perspective. The renewed mind enables his co-laborers to prove the will of God. We prove the will of God when we put on display the reality of heaven. We prove the will of God when we put on display, physical display, the reality of heaven. So the battle's in the mind. It's in the mind, the battle's in the mind. Amen? The mind is the essential tool of bringing the kingdom to reality, to the problems and the crisis people face. God has made it to be a gatekeeper of the supernatural. It's the gatekeeper of the supernatural. You can't be a climate changer and not have a renewed mind. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. Dr. Carroll reminded me or recommended me a book called Softwired that I've been reading and it's about the brain. Uh, a doctor by the name of Dr. Merzinich uh, wrote this book. And he says, do you know that in the natural, you have the power to change your brain for the better? Do you know that it is possible just naturally? Because um, we often hear, well I'm, well, I'm hardwired that way. That's, that's false. You're not hardwired, you're softwired. If you're hardwired, it's going to be very hard for you to change the way that your brain uh, f functions or the brain, how your brain develops over the years. So you're softwired. And Dr. Masinich explains how the brain rewires itself across its la lifespan and how you can take control of that process to improve your life. How you can rejuvenate, remodel, reshape your brain to improve it at any age. So if you can do that in the natural, come on, how much more powerful is it in the spiritual when we apply what Romans 12, 2 says, how we renew our minds on a daily basis? Because it's the gatekeeper of the supernatural. It's the gatekeeper of the supernatural. An unrenewed mind is like a piano that's out of, key, out of tune, or a key on the piano that's not quite right. 88 keys on the piano, but one is not tuned correctly. It just doesn't seem right. Once you discover that key, you don't use it anymore because it detracts from the music. You skip over it or you work around it. In the same way, people are very similar because some of us, that one thing could cause us to be out of sync with the mind of Christ will seldom get used. It'll cause you to be uh, just something just a little off about, and, and it doesn't matter how 
um, available you are to, to, uh, to be a part of what we're doing here at New Harvest Church. Uh, because uh, their thoughts conflict with the mind of Christ. Your thoughts are in constant conflict with what the mind of Christ really is and what it's doing. So um, in Mark chapter 6, in Mark chapter 6, um, they had just got back when Jesus uh, sent the, them out in pairs, two by two, they left. Uh, um, they had just got back and Jesus, or they were hearing the reports, or Jesus was hearing the reports of, uh, of the guys as they came back. And um, they left, they started to leave, or they left, uh, but the crowd, it says, started following him. And they caught up to him. And, uh, and they knew Jesus was going to do his whole compassion thing and, uh, and minister to the people. So they left. They caught up to him. And, uh, and, you know, and the disciples were like, well, we should, you know, it's late. The Bible says that they were in a, a deserted place. It wasn't like a place where there was like a big city around or anything like that. And uh, these disciples were like, well, we need to let them go. They need to go home and. Uh, so they can eat. And Jesus says, no, you feed them. He says, no, you feed them. And after he said that, he didn't laugh like he was joking around. He was serious. So he goes on. So the, the scripture says he feeds the 5,000 with the, the young boy's lunch. And, get, and listen to this. Listen to this. A renewed mind is to live with an awareness that God wants to do something through you, not just for you. It's an awareness that we have because a renewed mind causes us to have an awareness. It's not just about God getting something to me, which is great, but he wants to do something through me. Amen? Mark 6:45 says this, immediately he made his disciples go into the boat and go before him to the other side to uh, Bethsaida. While well, he sent the multitude away, he went and he had uh, sent them away. He departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the uh, middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. And then when he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against him, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. You know, there is, there is uh, this thing going on, especially in a church in North America. It's like a self-pity attitude amongst believers. Um, you know, because the Bible says that he would have just walked on past them. I mean, it says it right there. Um, you know, and then we, we tell ourselves, well, if it's the will of God for, for me to, to do this or, or if it's the will of God for me to uh, be healed of, of this or to be healed of this emotional um, uh, wound that I have um, or what, will it be that, that I eat or be healed, whatever it is, sometimes he doesn't come to your boat. Sometimes he walks just close enough to scare you. Just close enough where you can reach out and grab them. Faith brings answers. But enduring faith brings answers with character. Some answers we can't be trusted with. Unless there's an enduring faith that brings it about. Why? Why, why do you say that? Because the character will sustain the answer for long periods of time. In other words, it won't come and then be discarded because of poor stewardship. Come on, it's like pushing against a rock or like a big boulder. Yeah, you're pushing against it, 
But how many of you know that you're getting stronger? It might not be moving, but you are getting stronger. Whether you see it or not, you are getting stronger. Because he's looking for a people that won't get crushed by his blessing. Come on, how often have we seen that? In verse 49, it goes on to say that, And when he saw him walking by the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. That word troubled is like um, they, they probably needed new, a new robe. They probably needed new undergarments that were troubled. They were that scared. That's, I mean, literally, that, I mean, they were, that word trouble doesn't do justice of what, how they really reacted. And it says, but immediately he talked with them and said, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up to the boat uh, to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed uh, in themselves beyond measure, and they marveled. And 52 says, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Here's the point. Loaves, the loaves and fish experience where God had revealed to them the kingdom reality. The loaves and fish experience. God revealed the kingdom reality to them. But they didn't get it. They did not get it. Because they didn't get it, they couldn't draw from a renewed mind understanding of the kingdom to deal with the storm that they were facing while on the boat. Because if they had got it, if they had got it, they would have had a better understanding on how to deal with that storm. Um, because what did they miss? What did they miss here? They didn't get the fact that the food did not multiply in Jesus' hands. It multiplied in their hands. Jesus didn't multiply it. They missed the fact that when Jesus said, you feed them, you feed them. How do you know he never changes his mind? When he said, you feed them, I bet they had this dumb look on, on their faces like, well, there's, we're in a desolate place. We don't have any money. Judas has all the money, and he's not going to share it. There's no stores. But he instructed them how to do what he just commanded. And what's the point? What's the point? The renewed mind lives with an awareness that God enables what he commands. Your renewed mind lives with an awareness that what God enables is what he commands. That's what he meant when he said we are co-missioning. We are co-laboring. Because it says, for they did not understand the loaves and the fish. And therefore their heart was hardened. Their heart was hardened. Let's go to Mark 8. Mark 8, 13. Is this making sense? Is this bringing a new perspective on how, why they did what they did and how it all came about? Verse 13 says, And he left them, and getting in the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread this, this whole, these whole verses right here are hilarious. It said, now that they've forgotten to take bread, and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged him, saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He's like throwing all, I mean, I bet, he, I bet those guys are just confused. They're just confused out of all get out because, because they had forgotten to bring the bread 
he turns around and says, well, hold, hold on a second. You need to be careful of the leaven of Herod and the leaven of, of, uh, of uh, the Pharisees. And I bet those disciples are just looking at each other. And what in the world does that have to do with us only having one loaf of bread? What he's saying there, what Jesus is saying there, be careful of the influence. Because leaven talks about, all it needs is a little bit of leaven to influence something. A little bit of leaven ruins a whole uh, clump or whatever. So a little bit of leaven in your mind. He said, be careful. A little bit of leaven, a little bit of religious leaven in your mind is going to ruin that renewed mind that I'm trying to get you to. A little bit of leaven, a little bit of political leaven. Come on now. A little bit of political leaven, get it in your mind, is going to ruin your renewed mind. Come on, if you think uh, um, the, the Republican Party is, is the Christian Party, come on, that's a little bit of leaven in your mind. It's going to ruin your renewed mind. I can't get no help. Pastor Mark, I can't get no help here. It goes on to say, and they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have no bread, right? I mean, they're like, they, they're just, they're not getting it. Um, 17 says, but Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Or is your heart still hardened? There's your answer right there. 18 says, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do not... Uh, and do you not remember? And he goes on to uh, say here, when I broke the, the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? They said to them, 12. Also, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. Jesus is doing some divine math there. He's trying, and this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to shake them loose from the logic and the reason that is tied to earthly resources. That's what he's trying to do. Shake them loose of the logic and the reason that's tied to earthly resources. He's revealing to his children, not only do we have an identity, not only do we have a purpose, not only do we have a destiny, but we live with access to unlimited resources. Come on, and they're, they're not for personal gain per se. Come on, they're for to accomplish his will on the earth. They're to accomplish his purpose on the earth. Your destiny here on earth. So he's... But then he goes on to say, and this is probably one of, in this passage, probably one of the most powerful uh, verses, and it's verse 21. And he said to them, how is it you do not understand? How is it you do not understand? I'm sorry, verse 17 why do you reason that you have no bread? Remember, they're talking about, well, we only have one loaf. Why do you reason that you do not have any bread? Now, watch this. This is going to help somebody. Once we have experienced supernatural provision, like they did, we have lost the right to start any thought process with what we don't have. We have lost the right. Each and every single one of us in this building have lost the right to start any thought in your mind, to start any thought process in your mind with what you do not have. If you understand the whole principle of the loaves and the fishes, 
you don't have a right. None of us do. I know that's tough. I know that's a hard word. Because you might say, well, yeah, I ain't got nothing. That's just what the scripture says. I'm just interpreting what, what Jesus is saying. We do not have a right to start any thought process with what we don't have. I, and I'm not saying don't live in denial. I'm saying that that's not the basis of your thinking. Faith doesn't deny a problem's existence. It denies its place of influence. Faith doesn't deny a problem's existence. It denies its place of influence. Because he's saying, you better not get that thought in your head. When he says, why do you reason that you have no bread? They, had, they started that, that off totally incorrect. And he said, you better not do that. Because that thought will turn into something. That thought will kill your renewed mind. Mark chapter 9. We read this uh, in the beginning. Let me just read it again real quick. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to the high mountain apart from themselves. And he was transfigured, the renewed mind. Remember? Same word as the renewed mind. Before them, his clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. This is what the transfiguration was. The transfiguration was a physical illustration of what the renewed mind looks like in the spiritual. The transfiguration, say it again, was a physical illustration of what the renewed mind looks like in the spiritual. Can I get some agreement? Yes? No? Maybe. And it goes on to say, and Elijah appeared to them, Moses, they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered to them, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. I don't know that they experienced the presence of God like that before. There's something about a renewed mind that brings about the presence of God. And you can clearly hear the voice of God saying something to you. It just becomes easier. It says, this is my beloved son, hear him. Suddenly when they had looked around and they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves. Only Jesus with themselves. Because there's something about a renewed mind that causes Jesus to be the only. Causes Jesus to be the only. Regardless of whatever outside influences are trying to make their way into your mind. Come on, let's stand to our feet. We're just going to declare something this, this uh, morning. It's 1131. Y'all going to get out early. Can we just lift our hands this morning? Father God, we just declare Jesus. We just declare you as the only in our mind. Forgive us for wrong thoughts a wrong thought pattern, those areas in our lives that are just off. They're not tuned to what a renewed mind is. Father God, we just declare Jesus as the only in our lives. Come on, if there's any need among, amongst you, just whatever it is, put, put his name on it. 
Jesus, I just declare uh, financial provision. Father God, I just declare, Jesus, you are my healing. I thank you for that. Jesus, I thank you that you are my redeemer. I thank you, Jesus, that you are my restorer. I thank you, Jesus, that uh, you cause all things to work together for the good of those that love you. And I just thank you for that. Come on, if we're climate changers in this place, come on, let's stir up this place. Let's stir up uh, th this atmosphere. Because, I mean, we don't know what's going on with the person on the left or the person on the right. But we just declare that Jesus will be our only this morning. You know, I started off by saying that it is abnormal for a Christian not to have an appetite for the impossible. Because it's been written into our spiritual DNA. To hunger, to hunger for the impossibilities. Because we know that those impossibilities around us, they have to bow their knee to the name of Jesus. Because the lack of miracles isn't because it's not the will of God for us. The problem, like I said, exists between our ears. I just want, if, if we could just shift our mindset this morning and... Uh, And, and I know those, those guys on the, on, on the boat, those disciples, they just got hammered. And I know we, and, I, and I'm making light of, of their mistakes or misunderstanding of what Jesus was trying to say. But how many of you know that we do that stuff every day? Every day we do that. Every day we miss it like that. We do. I just really felt this um, for for somebody in this place this morning, and I, I don't I don't know who it is. We we just I took this week, me and my wife and and some of the other staff just took this week to just really just pray and see what the the needs of of the people are going to be this this morning. Because how many of you know that? God is still in the miracle working business. I mean, he can touch your life, change a situation, turn it around for the good. He desires that. In Luke chapter 1, verse number 11 through 13, it's the story of Zacharias, and, uh, who was the father of John the Baptist and his wife Elizabeth. And it goes on to say that then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. For your prayer is heard. How many of you know that verse 13 is an incorrect translation? It should read like this. It should read, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for the prayer that you stopped praying is now heard. For the prayer that you stopped believing in, for that thing that you stopped believing in, God has heard you. And I just feel this morning that there's some people in this building that you have stopped praying for whatever it was. You stopped a long time ago and you've probably forgotten about that promise. You've probably forgotten about that dream. But you know what? I believe that God wants to visit you in a supernatural way, just like he visited Zacharias. You know, because they were old. Old people ain't having babies like that. You know? That's why he stopped praying it, because he was, I don't know how old he was, but he was, he was up in age. They both were. That prayer that you stopped praying, I have heard you. I don't know if that's you this morning, but we just want to create an atmosphere. Not so that we can just remind God because that's silly, you know, he doesn't forget. 
But there's something about stirring up that at the atmosphere where that sort of stuff can come back into his remembrance per se. I know it's, it's weird to say it like that, but I don't know. I just, I just feel that for somebody here. I really do. Past dreams and past promises that you done forgot about. Is there anybody here that's battling? You just don't sleep at night. Whatever it is, whatever it may be, you just you just have trouble sleeping at night. And this goes for the people watching online as well. Another thing, I know it's summertime, and you would think that summer would be a time of rest, and it has been for some people. But one of the things that I felt this week was that you've just been toiling and toiling with your spirit. You're supposed to be at rest, but you can't find no rest. There's no peace going on there. Uh, I just want to say that you just need to just give it up and let the Holy Spirit do what he's supposed to do. I think that you've been getting in the way of what the Holy Spirit is trying to do because we need to enter into a position of rest so that he can go on our behalf. I believe there's somebody here that has emotional wounds from the past that have tormented you or that have stayed with you. Also, someone has, who has uh, lost connection with a loved one, it did just maybe just didn't end right that Maybe it's a son or a daughter who, I don't know, you guys got in a fight and you just never made up and you haven't talked in years. Or it could be a friend that you haven't talked in years. I believe that God wants to restore that. Also, I believe that there's somebody who knows what the next step is, but there's a fear. What Pastor Mark was saying, there's a fear to take that next step forward. We want to pray this morning for that probably one of the greatest quotes that I've ever heard on fear is by Dr. Jack Hayford when he said, how would you treat a friend who lied to you as much as your fears do? How would you treat a friend who lied to you as much as your fears do? It'll rob you. Fear will rob you. It robbed Peter from a perfectly good walk on the water. It robbed the other 11 from getting out of the boat. Also, uh, physical, any physical healing, any physical ailments. Vanessa brought up to me uh, shoulder injuries, past shoulder injuries, maybe the back, back injuries. So we just want to pray this morning for that. Pastor Mark, you got anything? Come on, I know, that, I don't know if you guys were just timid to raise your hands or, or whatever it is, but let's just pray for one another this morning. Um, and just ask, just ask Jesus to, to move on our behalf. And I just want to say this, it's not in your push. It's not in your push because you're not strong enough. It's in your position. It's not in your push. It's in your position. You can push all you want, but if you're not positioned correctly, your, your push is irre irrelevant. So all over the building, let's just raise our hands. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that you're reconnecting loved ones this morning. I thank you, Father God, that you're causing physical ailments to be corrected. I thank you, Father God, that people will, that have insomnia or trouble sleeping, I thank you, Father God, that you're going to cause them to have rest, physical and spiritual rest. I thank you, Father God, for that. I thank you, Father God, that people are going to be reminded of their past dreams, 
past hopes. I thank you, Father God, that just like uh, the angel Gabriel came to Zacharias and reminded him of the prayer that he stopped praying, I thank you, Father God, that, that you were going to have that renewed mind, Father God, that we're going to be able to hear your voice and we're going to hear things that, that we did not hear for years, that we forgot about years ago. And we thank you, Father God, for your goodness, your mercy for that. I thank you for it. I thank you, Father God, that we're not going to be living, we're not going to live by fear. But whoever that is, Father God, they're going to take that step forward. And they're going to move forward in you, Father God, because you have not given us the spirit of fear, Father God, but you have given us the spirit of a sound mind, power. I thank you for that, Father God. I thank you that you cause us to go forward in life. I thank you for that, Jesus. I thank you for it. I thank you for it. Yes, Lord. Come on, we position ourselves correctly. We position ourselves correctly in Christ. Yes, Lord. this morning that whatever Jesus comes in contact with we thank you that it either restores it moves it away whatever it is I just really feel feel that about the whole fear thing come on you don't need to let that thing enslave you anymore starts with a thought. It all starts with a thought. But we declare the goodness of God, His mercies this morning.
song one more time as Johnny sings that. Declare that over your life this morning. be grace for the journey. Thank you for joining us this morning. Father God, I just bless your people this morning. Let them go out, Father God, and find rest, find more of you this morning. We just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.